Like it or not, strong men shape our world. Today, we're going to look at two, one in Russia and one in Egypt. They both have very different fates, but those different fates are going to directly affect your life. We'll also take a look beyond this world and about how this universe connects to your future. Welcome back to Trumpet World. First today, we're going to look at Russian President Vladimir Putin, probably the world leader mentioned the most so far on this show. He's a critical figure. So much of forecasting revolves around what is he going to do next? How long is he going to be alive? And right now, Ukraine is invading Russia. We're seeing a lot of headlines about this being the end for Vladimir Putin. I'm joined today by Jeremiah Jacques, who's just written an article on exactly that in the Trumpet print edition. Jeremiah, thank you for joining us. And it seems like I've seen this headline quite a few times before. Yes, it's something that many Russia watchers have been noticing quite a bit lately. And to illustrate this, I'd like to start off with a quote from CNN. It says, it is not clear how Putin can reverse the slide. The turbulence is just beginning, end quote. So, you know, that's a sentiment that many Russia watchers have expressed in recent months. The Ukrainians really have dealt a humiliating blow to the Russians by invading the Kursk region of Russia. This marks the first time that Russia has been invaded by a foreign army since World War II. And the Ukrainians don't appear to have any plans to relinquish the hundreds of square miles of Russian territory that they've conquered. So it is a humiliation for Russian President Vladimir Putin. But here's the problem for those who are anxious to see Putin ousted. That CNN article that I just quoted is not about Ukraine's invasion of Kursk. In fact, it's not a recent article. It was actually published in December of 2011, just after Putin's party had performed below expectations in parliamentary elections. At that time, 13 years ago, the CNN writer was one of several who were kind of pinning Putin's epitaph. And that, of course, has not been the only time that analysts have predicted Putin's downfall. Over the last decade and a half, all kinds of gloomy predictions have been issued for him time and again. In 2012, The Economist headlined, the beginning of the end of Putin. And then in 2014, analyst Paul Vail said events at that time posed, quote, an existential threat to Putin's regime. In 2017, the New Yorker said protests created, quote, a sense that after 17 years, Vladimir Putin's political system was running out of arguments to justify its continued monopoly hold on power. And then last summer, the voices heralding Putin's demise, they really reached kind of a, a fever pitch. That's when the Wagner Group staged a mutiny. They started marching toward Moscow. Incredibly dramatic events were unfolding there. And publications from Foreign Policy to The Economist were saying that it really was the end for him. We saw headlines like, the beginning of the end for Putin. And Putin has shown he can no longer maintain order among his warlords. Many people were saying that at that time, it was finally, this time, finally, the end for Putin. So here we are now, and Ukraine has invaded Russia's Kursk region, and they've conquered hundreds of miles of Russian territory. And it is true that with this invasion, the Ukrainians have brought the war to Russia in an unprecedented way. The maps show that Ukraine conquered more of Russia in about nine days than Russia had conquered of Ukraine in the previous nine months. And the hundreds of square miles that they conquered included one of Russia's most important gas transit hubs, which Ukraine could now destroy at any time. And tens of thousands of Russians have been evacuated from the captured area, and the Russians apparently lack a strategy to push the Ukrainians out. So this development, it has been a major black eye for Putin, and it should come as no surprise that the commentators once again are ringing his death knell. And so they're saying that this time, this time, it really is the end. But at the trumpet, 
we think that just like the way CNN was wrong about his demise back in 2011, and just like The Economist was wrong about his you know, imminent ouster back in 2012, and just like The New Yorker was wrong in 2017, and just like all the analysts were wrong last year with the Wagner mutiny, just as with all those cases, the trumpet now thinks that those saying that this time it is the end for Putin are wrong once again, and we think that he will hold power. It's an interesting tie in, I think, almost to what Mr. Hillock and I were discussing on this show a couple of weeks ago, where we keep writing his epitaph, I think in part because of wishful thinking. We don't like him. We think he's a bad guy, so we want him gone. But I wonder whether it ties into this kind of democracy conversation that we were having back then uh, about like democracy is just so ingrained in our minds as being the superior form of government that we see a dictator, an autocrat, and we say that's got to be unstable. Uh, and so we're all, anytime there's any obstacle, like, well, that's it, he's tripping over, he's falling, he's falling flat on his face. And I mean, that's not to say that autocracy is stable, but democracy isn't exactly stable either. These are all flawed forms of government, like we, we talked about on that show. But we so worship democracy, like, well, he's going to, he's going to go. But it's not just, say, a psychoanalysis of the Western mindset that has led us to this conclusion. This is something that is very clearly and directly uh, influenced by Bible prophecy. And that's probably what you, you, you spent, or informed by Bible prophecy. And that's probably what you spent the bulk of your article talking about. That's right. Yes. Part of the reason why we disagree with those who think that he's, you know, on the way out is uh, his track record. You know, you can look back on 24 years of Putin's rule, and throughout all that time, he's proven himself to be a remarkably crafty survivor. He threads the needle, and he clings to power. But for us at the Trumpet, it's, it's not really about that. It's, it's really just because of the teachings of the Bible that we believe he'll stay in power. It was around the year 90 AD that the Apostle John recorded a prophecy describing a military force of 200 million men. You can see that in Revelation 9.16. And a force that size would be far larger than anything ever assembled in human history, about 15 times larger than anything we've seen in the past. And then other Bible passages provide details about this massive power. Revelation 16.12 calls it the kings of the east, showing that it'll be a multinational coalition of Asian nations. And then Daniel 11 and 12 show that it will be among the main belligerents in World War III. And then Ezekiel 38 verse 2 reveals that this multinational Asian coalition will have one nation and really one man at the helm. In the New King James Version, verse 2 calls him, quote, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And if you study into these names, you see that Rosh is a name for Russia, which was once called Rus, anciently. Um, and this is something that commentaries such as the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown acknowledge. And then the other two names mentioned here, Meshach and Tubal, those indicate major Russian cities, Moscow and Tobolsk. And then Ezekiel 38 goes on to show the conquests of this mighty force led by this Russian prince. And it also discusses the army's eventual defeat. And in the Trumpet's September 2014 issue, Editor-in-Chief Gerald Flurry identified who this man is, this man who will be leading this massive Asian power. He wrote, I strongly believe Vladimir Putin is going to lead the 200 million man army. Just look at the power he already has. Can you think of any other Russian politician who could become so powerful and have the will to lead Russia into the crisis of crises? I see nobody on the horizon who could do that and only a tiny few years remain for the Prince of Rosh to appear. This much is absolutely certain. The restoring of Russia's power by Vladimir Putin, the Prince of Russia, was prophesied. He's already solidly allied Russia with China. The prophecy about the Prince of Russia includes that main alliance. The only question is whether or not Putin personally finishes the entire prophecy." End quote. So that was in 2014. And then Mr. Fleury continued to write about this in the following years. And by the time he published the 2021 edition of his booklet, The Prophesied Prince of Russia, 
he had removed all doubt from his stance. And that booklet, he writes, his track record, his nationality, and his ideology show that he is fulfilling a linchpin Bible prophecy. The time frame of his rule also shows that nobody else could be fulfilling the Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecy. We need to watch Vladimir Putin closely. He is the Prince of Rosh, whom God inspired Ezekiel to write about 2,500 years ago, end quote. So, you know, given our view of Putin's key role in in time Bible prophecy, the trumpet does not agree with those who claim that his demise is now imminent or that Ukraine's invasion of Kursk spells the end for Vladimir Putin. Now, this is a very specific, testable prophecy. Bible prophecy is not like Nostradamus that's making these very vague forecasts and you can kind of read almost whatever you want into them. Vladimir Putin is going to stick around as president of Russia. It's a very specific, testable, almost scientific forecast that you could say that you can watch and, and you can prove. And obviously, that's something you can still watch for for the future. But Mr. Um, Mr. Flurry has already made accurate forecasts based on and informed by that same prophecy that you can see have been fulfilled already. Yes, that's right. As as I mentioned in uh, in one of the quotes there, a part of the the passage there in Ezekiel thirty eight really brings the land of Magog into the equation, and that is a, a geographic territory that includes China. So from that, Mister Flurry has said, um, China will be Russia's number one ally in this in this alliance that Russia leads. And so, you know, he's been sounding the alarm for years about Russia and China forming a, a close partnership with other Asian nations and just showing how much that will destabilize the world. And of course, if you look at Russia and China today, you see that they are, they're as thick as thieves. They're remarkably close ideologically. Of course, you know, geographically, they share the border there. Economically, they're China is one of the big reasons why Russia has even been able to continue its war on Ukraine after two and a half years now. It's throwing lifeline after lifeline to the Russians. And uh, even politically, you see the, the Chinese helping Russia with United Nations votes and things of that nature. So I think that that's a part of the forecast that we can see has already really come to pass. Yes, thanks for that. Uh... I think one that really stands out to me is uh, Mr. Flurry had this statement in the Prophesied Prince of Rosh booklet that based on the way Ezekiel 38 is worded, and it talks about the Prince of Rosh and then mentions the several other different names for the Russian peoples. Uh, and he said in that booklet, this giant swath of land indicates the prince will probably conquer more nations of the former Soviet Union. That was long before the latest phase of the Ukraine invasion. And we've seen Vladimir Putin try to bring other parts of the former Soviet Union under his wing. So this is a prophecy where we've had aspects of it proven true. And we've got a very clear, provable forecast for what is going to happen next. So keep your eye on that. Thank you very much, Jeremiah, for informing us of that. We're going to take a break and then we'll look at another very specific forecast about a very different strongman and how he's going to end up with his country and his rule going in a very different direction. We'll be right back. Israel, rightly, is the focus of the Middle East. But the war in Gaza and the war in Ukraine are having a massive impact on another country, one that is at a real risk of completely falling apart. And one that we don't hear a massive about in the news today. But the collapse or political turmoil in this country has global implications. That country is Egypt. Mihailo Zekic has an article on Egypt's situation in our latest Trumpet Print magazine. And he's here with me now to talk about that article. Thanks for joining us, Mihailo. How bad is it? I don't want to be hyperbolic, but... With the state of the Egyptian economy, not just this year, but for the past several years, I honestly would not be surprised if we had a revolution sometimes within the next 12 months. Um, in April, the International Monetary Fund estimated that Egypt's inflation rate, just with its currency itself, is about 
5%. That's the ninth highest in the world. And for some perspective, that's higher than some other notorious trouble spots like Haiti or Bangladesh. Um, it's the second largest debtor nation to the International Monetary Fund. And this is obviously having massive ripple effects in this country that's over 110 million people, most of which are clustered around the Nile Delta. Most of this country is not capable of sustaining food or, or urban development. It's obviously in the middle of the desert. And because of problems like the currency that we were talking about and a host of other issues that you alluded to, which we'll talk about a little bit later, people are starting to feel the pinch in Egypt. This is what Vivian Yi, the New York Times Cairo bureau chief said in uh, January last year, quote, grocery prices are stratospheric. Money is worth half of what it was a year ago. For many, eggs are now a luxury and meat is off the table. For others, burdened with school fees and medical expenses, the middle class lives they have worked doggedly to sustain are slipping beyond their grasp, end quote. And this is, again, from her perspective, that she was writing January of last year. And these trends that she was talking about haven't uh, gotten any better and certainly have gotten worse. Things are pretty serious in Egypt right now. So maybe to start with food. I mean, this is, I mean, you're, you're a historian as well. I mean, so this is, this plays a huge role in so many revolutions, you know, the Russian revolution, the French revolution, food is so often a kind of an immediate catalyst there. I think in your article, you talked about one in five Egyptian children have stunted growth due to undernourishment. I mean, that's not just people complain. I mean, inflation, things like that, they hurt anyway. But that is a, a sobering statistic about just how bad the most one of these most basic needs is becoming in Egypt. Yes. And it has been actually bad for quite a long time because of statistics like that, because of uh, poverty rates, Egypt has had a bread subsidiary program for going back all the way to when it was a British protectorate. And every time an Egyptian leader's tried to get rid of it, there's been mass riots, but they've had good reason to get rid of it because it costs like 2% of the country's GDP, just subsidizing people's bread. Wheat and grain products especially is an important uh, f uh, part of the functioning of the Egyptian economy, of functioning of society in and of itself. And you alluded to the Ukraine war. This has had dramatic effects on uh, Egypt, especially. Egypt constantly uh, uh, is uh, ping-ponging with China to get the number one spot of the world's biggest wheat importer because of the bread subsidy program. And China's 10 times the population. Yes, exactly. And China obviously has a lot more land to grow food with. Egypt's in the middle of the desert. It has the Nile River. The Nile River has been able to sustain civilizations for millennia, but not of 110 million people. Russia, meanwhile, is the world's largest exporter of wheat. Ukraine, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I believe it's fifth or sixth. When the war started, that all that supply lines got immediately disrupted. There has been a little bit of, um, I guess you could say, mending of the ties since then. But one of the things Ru Russia especially has tried to do is to try and leverage cutting off these exports, both theirs and Ukraine's with the you know, infamous Black Sea targetings, to try and get some of these third world countries like Egypt more on their side, more pressuring the rest of the international community to get the West to back off, to take sanctions off Russia. Egypt is feeling the pinch. And this is, in a sense, it's deliberate and man-made for countries just like Egypt. Again, as I mentioned, some of uh, this has been remedied. Ukraine has been relying on like sending wheat through NATO waters uh, to get things done. But for a country in Egypt situation, even just a minor, it's not a minor, even like a shock like that uh, momentarily for the system, that's going to have massive reverberations throughout the economy. So the subsidized bread program, I think you wrote that 70% of the population are on this subsidized bread. Uh, they put the prices up fourfold in June. And you know, by subsidized bread, this is very subsidized bread. I think it used to be one tenth of a cent per loaf. And these are smaller loaves. They're not, they're, it's it's kind of more like say a roti bread than a, than a big Western style loaf. But still a tenth of a cent, it's gone up to a more like 0.4 of a cent, about half a cent a loaf. So heavily subsidized. And so this is where, okay, the, there's all these food shocks that have hit, but it means that so many other things hit bread and food because of 
2% of the government's expenditure going to food. And the fact that Egypt needs then foreign currency to buy this food from other places. And Egypt doesn't make a lot that they export. They don't have a very diverse way of getting their hands on foreign currency that they need to buy food. Uh, instead, it's just a couple of key sources that have also been hit. Uh, and so you know, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about, about some of those. Uh, I guess tourism being probably the big one. Like I remember 10 years ago, I would hear about people going on holiday to Egypt. I don't anymore. Uh, I mean, that's some, but, but as, as you listen to this, like all of this directly impacts food because the government is using the money that it gets from tourism and these other situations to buy food to feed its own people. So this is, I think, much more socially significant than when you have currency problems and economic difficulties in a lot of other countries, because Egypt is dependent on these to meet the most basic needs of, it, of its population. Exactly. You mentioned tourism. Tourism comprises roughly 15% of Egypt's GDP. 15% is basically met by just people coming from abroad and spending money on hotels and whatnot to go visit the pyramids. And there's obviously been a lot of other crises uh, to impact tourism, not just the Ukraine war. A third of uh, Russia's tourists actually came from Russia and Ukraine. And then that obviously- A third of Egypt's tourists. Or e Egypt's tourists, pardon me. Um, but you also had crises like the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course famously shut down global travel. For a lot of us in the West, maybe we were itching on our seats. Oh, that means we can't go and vacation on the beach in Spain anymore. As far as Egypt was concerned, that was basically drying up one of their key pillars of their economy. Um, prior to COVID, Egypt just met a record max of 13 million tourists in 2019 going to visit. Um, and that dropped to 3.6 tourists uh, in, going into the 2020 fiscal year. The 2020-2021 fiscal year plunged uh, its revenue of tourism nearly 70%. And again, COVID's over at this point. It's been over for a little bit. Tourism is starting to pick back up, but it's not like what it was as you were talking about, that Egypt is like the go-to place for a lot of people. And again, with such a country that already has a poverty problem like Egypt, that has all these other problems hitting it, like like even with the momentary pause, that's gonna eat up people's not savings, like whatever they had left, that's gonna take a lot of time to make back up. And especially with the inflation I was talking about, when they do make it up, it's not gonna be worth much anyway. And it can easily become a vicious cycle where like, okay, Egypt is poorer, so it's less safe. So people feel less comfortable going there on holiday. So it becomes poorer and less safe and it can kind of spiral downhill. And then to complete this perfect storm though, we have the Gaza war and then some of the way, okay, that makes the general region less appealing as a holiday destination, but more, there's much more direct effects for Egypt. Yes, well, the Gaza war has been interesting because they Egypt's been one of the few countries that has been able to speak both with Israel and Hamas. So they've actually been getting a little bit of foreign support that way. But the main reason that people are sending money to keep the, the mediation going is because they see how bad the economy is with Egypt, including especially in a major way with the Gaza war. And that revolves around the Houthi uh, extremist group in Yemen, um, as I'm sure most of our uh, viewers would know last November. Uh, they joined in the war uh, with Hamas, like Hamas are an Iranian proxy, and they started targeting Western shipping going through the southern exit point of the Red Sea that was meant to hurt Israeli trade going to uh, the port in Eilat there on Israel's coast in the Gulf of Aqaba. Israel does not depend on the Red Sea and that maritime corridor nearly as much as Egypt does. Because everyone's paying money to Egypt to use it. Yeah, everyone's paying money to Egypt to use the Suez Canal. And, and it's a massive, like, it's really expensive to take a, a big boat through the Suez. Yeah. So obviously not targeting the Suez Canal itself, but if you target the Bab el Mandeb Strait, I mean, you need both points of the Red Sea to use it. And if one side go, gets out of commission, then the Suez Canal is basically worthless. Um, and you mentioned costs. Uh, in January, just this past January, just a couple months after the uh, Houthis started their campaign, the Suez Canal Authority reported that they had lost about 40% of the revenue they had that time last year, which, I mean, again, just in two months, that's a massive hit to the economy. And obviously the Houthis to this day are still targeting the uh, Red Sea shipping. 
Um, I think the initial shock has worn a little bit down, but it's still a threat. People are still avoiding that corridor. And as long as the war keeps going on, Egypt is still going to feel that pinch. And this to me is where this story just gets insane. Like, okay, Egypt is facing this perfect storm of crises where all of these different events going on for very different reasons, kind of completely unconnected, like the Ukraine war, the Gaza war, they're all combining to cause this perfect storm for Egypt. And, you know, okay, well, what do you do if your family is facing bankruptcy, you can't afford meat, you're struggling to put food on the table, you don't know how you're going to pay your bills tomorrow. You don't decide that now is the perfect time to put in a brand new kitchen with state-of-the-art appliances and granite countertops and a 4K TV in your kit. Like, but that is exactly what Egypt is doing right now. Uh, exactly. We're going to play a, a slightly spiced clip now that the Wall Street Journal put together of Egypt's probably most notorious spending project. Sitting over 20 miles east of the current capital in Cairo, Egypt is building a new administrative capital from the ground up. The nearly $58 billion plan includes a miles-long central park, a main business district with a Chinese-built tower, and massive new headquarters for the Egyptian Ministry of Defense, known as the Octagon. But some say... It's a city for 6 million people, and I don't think there are 6 million people that can actually afford this city. After that was referring to what the Egyptian government is calling the new administrative capital. They plan on giving it a new name sometime soon. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know that. And I thought Nak was a terrible name for a capital. <laughs> yeah, I. Th they've been saying they've wanted to get a new name for, for a while and they haven't actually done it. So I don't know what they're dragging their feet for. But um, as you can see from the video, it's uh, further to the east from Cairo. It's basically a brand new city in the middle of the Sahara Desert. The official excuse of why they're building this is Cairo has 22 million people, it's congested, it's like not the say, uh, cleanest place to have an efficient functioning running government. A lot of people think that it's more for CC trying to get out of uh, Cairo's potentially unruly population in case if there's another revolt like we saw in 2011, he could be outside of the fray and handle it better. But with spending priorities like that, with phase one in and of itself costing $58 billion, like which was an increase of what they were expecting to pay for it for things like the world's largest defense ministry. I guess the Pentagon was too small for CC, so he had to go a, a couple of degrees bigger. Like, yeah, it's, a, it's an octagon. Yeah, it's an and octagon. It's bigger and better than the Pentagon because it's got eight sides. Yes, like the average Egyptian looking at that, like I think they all know on the street what this is really about for. Like uh, the New York Times, I remember in an article they wrote about this, they... Uh, asked one of the construction workers uh, about this and the, and he just said, yeah, none of this is for us. And then he looked at a billboard of CC and said, it's for him. Like, and other like grandiose uh, a aspects of the city, like the world's largest cathedral in the Middle East when like the Coptic Orthodox Church already has a cathedral in Cairo, like the largest skyscraper in Africa. Like it's- Africa's second largest mosque. Yeah, it's basically one big vanity project. And it's not the only one. They're also building- uh, outside the pyramids, the Grand Egyptian Museum. Uh, it's costing about $1 billion to build. It's going to be the largest archaeological museum when finished. The uh, CC even oversaw construction of the world's largest suspension bridge. Um, it's, and granted, some of these are like projects that say started under Mubarak, and now the view is like we have, like we made it this far, we might as well finish it. And this kind of investment obviously. Like, you know, if that museum is going to help with the tourist industry and whatnot. But at the same time, like, there are a lot of easier ways to jumpstart the economy, even with infrastructure projects than these grandiose visions. And even some of the projects that they've been trying to do to jumpstart the economy, like an expansion of the Suez Canal, that actually hasn't, like, even before the Houthis have been attacking, that actually hasn't been giving the revenue they were hoping it would be giving. So Egypt is spending basically like drunken sailors to get this going and uh and again the people know what this is all about this is a like in 2019 um there was an incident where a bunch of uh uh where a huge crowd of people were protesting cc in constructing a bunch of palaces uh for himself and after thousands were incarcerated he told media and i quote so what if i have palaces and then you contrast that with the second clip we'll play. Unfortunately, it's in Arabic, but there are subtitles. 
If the price of progress and prosperity for the nation is that it does not eat or drink like others do, then we will not eat or drink. And by we, he means all those millions of people in Cairo we were talking about. And I don't know how he summarizes like prosperity with not eating and drinking. I guess it might be a let them eat cake moment that he had. But again, Egyptians know that this is not about fundamentally jump-starting the economy. He's basically, you mentioned the Russian Revolution. He's basically turning Egypt into his own personal czarist playground for all intents and purposes. He saw like Egypt's leader Mubarak getting overthrown is not ancient history. Like, he was on the scene. He saw that happen. I guess, does he believe that he's just got enough control of the army that it doesn't matter what people think? Or has he just lost it at, at this point? Like, it, it just, this whole side of the story seems utterly, utterly bizarre to me. I mean, I, I Admittedly, I am not an expert on Sisi. I've not really studied his biography that much, but he, he, he never really struck me as a, as a megalomaniac. Only Sisi knows what Sisi's thinking, but at the same time, I think he knows in the back of his head that Egypt geopolitically is a bit too big to fail for a lot of countries mm. in the world. So like I mentioned, the International Monetary Fund, every like now and then you'll hear him again going for another loan and they'll give it to him usually with no strings attached or at least with minimal strings attached. Um, Israel, of course, Sisi's arguably Israel's best friend in the Arab world. They can't afford to let him uh, leave. Um, he's also really close with Russia, as I mentioned. He has ties with the United States. I think he's banking, uh, no pun intended, on uh, if mm. things were to go south, then the international community is going to be there for him to keep him propped up because they saw what happened with Mubarak and much of the rest of the world doesn't want a repeat of that. That makes sense. So I guess that's his calculus. We're expecting something very different, and that is because of, and this is something that is so easy to read and very specific, directly out of the Bible, where you know you can just read a, a verse or two and see where the Bible tells you this is going to turn around. And that particular verse or a passage of verses would be in Daniel 11. Uh, verse 40 talks about an end time clash between a king of the north and a king of the south. We've talked many times in this program before about the king of the north being a uniting European power and the king of the south being a radical Islamist power uh, led by Iran and that the king of the north comes in to deal with this rising Islamist uh, uh, block forming. Iran's going to be the leader of this block, but it's not going to be the only country in that block. And if you keep reading further, especially verses 42 and 43, it talks about the land of Egypt not escaping from the king of the north's path. Verse 43 mentions that the king of the north will have power over all the gold and silver and the precious things of Egypt, implying that Egypt is allied with the king of the south. And interestingly enough, in those sections of verses, Egypt is actually mentioned more often than the actual king of the south is. And it's the one mentioned with all like the gold and the wealth and Egypt's obviously in a shaky position right now, but it's still a powerful country. It still has an amazingly powerful military. The military has been running the country for decades. It still has an amazing geography. And it looks like that does not leave the, uh, or the king of the north notices that. In regards to where this plays with Iran, etc. the implication is that somehow Egypt gets into Iran's orbit. That's very, very unlikely with the current administration. Anything's possible, but... What we're watching mainly for is a type of revolution like we saw in 2011, like we saw that ousted Mubarak and brought in the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, the, this group that wants a reset with Iran, that wants to get behind Iran's vision. Right now, the Muslim Brotherhood isn't particularly popular in Egypt, but I mean, with all the circumstances going on right now, I mean, the Bolsheviks weren't popular in Russia leading up to the revolution. The people weren't revolting because of communism. Like you said, uh, they, they're revolting because they didn't have bread. And then the Bolsheviks were the best organized and most ruthless of quite a few different groups that were able to take advantage of that. And then you could easily see the Muslim Brotherhood backed by Iran falling into exactly the same category. That's what they did in 2011. And I mean, like you said, you could easily see that uh, this doing right now. And as I mentioned at the start, with all these crises hitting Egypt, and I'm a little bit amazed more people aren't talking about it. Like, I wouldn't be surprised within the next 12 months, we do get a revolution there. And of course, even if there is a revolution there, everybody, I mean, thought that, you know, Egypt might finally become a liberal democracy in 2011. That's not what happened. But 
even if there is a revolution forming, we can't really know what the outcome is just by looking at the facts on the ground. That's where the Bible prophecy comes in. And that's why we watch Egypt because it's the Bible, because the book of Daniel says Egypt is important. And, and even, you know, this is not just like one other country in the Middle East having another regime change. This is not like something that's going to be yesterday's news pretty fast. Egypt, as I mentioned, has a huge military. If it becomes Islamist, it's going to change the security factor in Israel in a dramatic way. Um, our editor-in-chief, Mr. Joe Fleury, has talked about once Egypt falls, you could see a lot of other countries in Africa falling to radical Islam. This is not just a localized issue. This is going to impact the whole world. Right. This is a very big deal. Now, Egypt, Daniel 11, it tells us that the king of the north is going to come and it's going to attack the king of the south. It will conquer the king of the south and Egypt. And so, as you said, the implication of that is that Egypt is aligned with the king of the south. And as we've said, since certainly the mid 90s, the early 90s, radical Islam led by Iran is this king of the south. And we have a whole booklet, the king of the south booklet that goes through and explains exactly why we say that, but Daniel 11 says specifically that this is a clash that will happen at the time of the end. And it's a clash that this makes it clear this passage. It revolves around the glorious land, the holy city. You know, it revolves around Jerusalem. So where can we see a clash building between a, a king of the north and a king of the south, kind of this northern power, the southern power that revolves around Jerusalem? And it's quite clear that it's this Christian Muslim clash with a radical Islamist king of the south and a European king of the north. That is building. And so all along, we've said that you're going to see Egypt aligned with this radical Muslim king of the south. And that is a massive forecast. Like Mr. Flurry was saying this in the 90s. And the, the, the Iranians were implicated in the assassination of Anwar Sadat. I think they even, they even named streets in Tehran after the guy that killed this beloved Egyptian president. I mean, it would be like Russia having Lee Harvey Oswald Street in the middle of Moscow. Uh, it was quite a provocation. And, and they were they were backing the Muslim Brotherhood. Were, this led to massive ruptures between Egypt and Iran. They you know, didn't have any diplomatic, you know, they closed their embassies, no flights, none of these things. The two hated each other for decades. And that's when Mr. Flurry made this forecast. So this is a pretty epic turnaround, but it's a turnaround. In some ways we're seeing already, like I think it was just a few months ago, you had the first ambassadors or first embassies start to be set up between these two countries. There is already even under Sisi a, a certain amount of rapprochement going on between these two. And perhaps there is a path to these two allying without the necessity for a revolution. Maybe if Egypt just kind of gets really desperate for money and Iran is willing to give it to them, uh, but Iran has had strong links to this Muslim Brotherhood terrorist group that is really the, the Hamas is the Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. So, you know, that gives you, I think, a sense of some of the close relationship that Iran has with this group. There's a very strong likelihood that they can come in, work with this group if there's a revolution and it will change the world. I mean, Mr. Flurry, I had, you mentioned that I had a few quotes I wanted to bring to you from, from this King of the South booklet where he draws attention to the way that it talks about Egypt and then Libya and Ethiopia. And he says the emphasis in Daniel 11, verse 42 to 43, is on Egypt. Then we have Libya and Ethiopia. This shows that Egypt is the big conquest. It is the real power behind Libya and Ethiopia, which suggests that it is going to have a heavy hand in swinging these two nations into the Iranian camp. We need to understand the enormous impact that Egypt working with Iran will have in the Middle East and even globally. This Iran-Egypt axis will change the game in the Middle East, particularly in Libya and Ethiopia. And he, Mr. Fowler goes on to talk about all the billions America has given Egypt, like since the Camp David Accords. And this has been a massive sort. They've got a really well-equipped military. What can Iran do with that? I mean, look at how Gaza has been a thorn in Israel's side. What if instead of Gaza, it's Egypt? Like this completely fundamentally changes all the basic assumptions about Israel's security, about the idea that they won't have to face a major two-front war where they're facing a nation in the north and a nation in the south like they had to in things like the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War. 
Um, and then they've got a modern, well-equipped army that's an enemy nation in their southern border. You look at Egyptian poll, uh, opinion polls in Egypt, you bring democracy to Egypt and they're going to war with Israel the next day. Like that is overwhelmingly popular. So this really is a massive deal for Egypt, for the Middle East, for Iran, for Israel, but for the whole world. The Gaza, the, the Suez Canal means that Europe will be very directly impacted. The global economy will be very directly impacted. All of oil, very dramatic, dramatically impacted. Like this is something that will reverberate around the world in a huge way. But most importantly, this is something directly prophesied in your Bible. And you can very clearly read those scriptures for yourself. Just read Daniel 11 verses 40 to 43. And you can see, you know, that's that very logical uh, inference that, okay, well, the king of the north conquers the king of the south and Egypt. Therefore, the king of the south and Egypt are aligned. You can read that for yourself and then you can watch that happen on the world scene. And you can see, again, this this principle that we come back to so much from the Bible that Daniel wrote earlier, that God rules in the kingdom of men. And that's that's a universe shaking truth that you can also take away from Daniel 11. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mihailo, for that, I think, really undervalued but critically important story. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with another universe shaking truth. Welcome back to Trumpet World. Elon Musk announced over the weekend that his first Starship to Mars would launch in about two years. In four years, he hopes to be sending people. And in about 20 years, he wants to have a self-sustaining city set up on the surface of Mars. Now, these are bold, but not entirely empty words. SpaceX's latest mission launched just on Tuesday. Polaris Dawn is going to travel to Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. It has four crew members who are going to perform the first commercial spacewalk. SpaceX's work on a reusable heavy rocket is just incredible. I think it's one of the most amazing things the human mind has produced. This massive rocket for getting man to the stars and then coming back down and landing again so that it can go up again. You know, this reusable rocket brings down the cost of space travel enormously. Now, of course, SpaceX isn't the only one looking at taking men to the stars. Space tourism is taking off in more ways than one, pardon the pun. Uh, it's growing. From, it's a growing business. It's expected to grow from being worth about 834 million US dollars to over 5 billion over the course of the next 10 years. That's according to a report from the market research company Brainy Insights published just in August. And if you have a spare three or four hundred thousand US dollars or euros, then you can get into space. I mean, if you have a spare that amount of money, I can imagine quite a lot of better causes you could probably spend it on. But you can uh, you can pay for space tourism. If I had that much money, I'd be tempted. But the, those ticket prices, of course, those rockets to the space, they're only for the rich. There are high-tech balloon companies that are trying to bring that price down. There's companies like Worldview, Space Perspective, and Zef Alto. Uh, they're working to send people into the stratosphere using pressurized capsules and gas-filled balloons. Uh, they, they go about 15 to 19 miles above Earth's surface, and they aim to kind of be high enough to give you an overview of Earth, I guess, kind of similar to the one behind me right now. And they're, they're trying to do it, I think, for about a third of the price, maybe 100,000 US dollars. Now, the idea of spending that kind of money to get to space, setting up a city on Mars, it can sound bizarre, absurd, extreme. Will mankind ever reach space? Well, your Bible has the answer. And it actually reveals an incredible connection between what is out there and you. Today, I want to look at just a few basic scriptures that connect the universe with your future. And I want to start in Isaiah chapter 45. We'll look at a verse here in Isaiah 45 and verse 18 that states, For Thus says the Eternal that created the heavens and God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. 
I am the eternal and there is none else. And did God create the heavens to be inhabited? I think most just apply the inhabited part here to the earth if they think about this verse at all. But could this verse really be saying that God has a purpose that will see the entire universe, the heavens, inhabited? Well, let's look at some other scriptures to see the answer. We'll go over to the book of Hebrews, where we'll probably spend most of our time today, as it does make this subject very clear. Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 5, where it says, For unto the angels has he not put into subjection the world to come whereof we speak? So the world to come, the world tomorrow, the coming future world, as opposed to the present evil world. And God says, well, he hasn't put this coming world to come whereof we speak in subjection to the angels. But one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? So this is quoting Psalm chapter 8. David wrote this. And Psalm 8 just talks about man ruling the earth and lists man being given dominion over all of the animals. And Paul references that, but takes it even further. In verse 7, you made him a little lower than the angels or a little while lower. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hand. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And what's this talking about, all things? Is this just talking about the earth? Well, first note, man has dominion over the earth already. But here it says, for in that he put in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So this all things that God is going to give man, he hasn't given him yet. That can't just be applying to the earth. If we look over in Hebrews 1 and verse 2, well, I'll start in the very beginning. Hebrews 1 and verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So here it's the same all things, the same Greek word. And here the Moffat Bible translates this as the universe. Jesus Christ is heir of the universe, heir of all things. And verse uh, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10 com confirm that Christ rules all the universe, including the heavens. This is what Hebrews 2 and verse 8 means when it says all things, but we see not yet all things put under him. Man is also going to rule the universe. And we continue here. It says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. And then verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So we don't see man ruling all things yet, but we do see Jesus Christ. And we see that he has already inherited rulership over all things, rulership over the universe. Verse 10, for it became him who are all things, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many, many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctified and they that are sanctified are all one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus Christ calls us brethren. We have the same inheritance as him. Mr. Armstrong wrote in his book, The Incredible Human Potential, in other words, Christians having God's spirit are joint heirs with Christ to inherit all that Christ already has inherited. He is now in glory. He has already inherited the entire universe. And could that really be true? That Christ has inherited the universe and we are set to inherit it too? Let's look at Romans chapter 8 that makes this clear. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ... If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We share in that inheritance. And what, does, what is Christ's inheritance? Hebrews 1 and verse 2 says he is heir of all things. Or as the Moffat Bible translates that, heir of the universe. And then Romans 8 and verse 17 tells us we are joint heirs. We share in the same inheritance that Jesus Christ has already. 
Uh, it says that we are children of God, that we will be, we'll, we'll be glorified together. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, as it says in Romans 1 and verse 4. And we are joined heirs with him, and we will also become sons of God by the resurrection from the dead. We go back up to verse 16. It says, well, verse 15, it says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Translators put in that adoption. That's not in the original Greek. It should be the spirit of sonship. We're not adopted sons. We will be born into God's family by the resurrection from the dead. We will be born into the sons of God. We will be glorified together like Jesus Christ is already glorified. And Romans 8 ties in perfectly with Hebrews 1 and 2 and also brings the universe into the picture. I mean, we see that in verse 19. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know, it's waiting for them to be born into the, son, into the family of God with power from the resurrection from the dead. Verse 20, for the, cre the creature or the creation was made subject to vanity or to futility, to decay, not willingly, but by the reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. For we know now that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. So the whole universe has been made subject to decay. We see that with all of these robotic missions that have already gone to Mars. It's waste and empty. Now, God didn't create it like that. Isaiah chapter 45 that we read already, it says, well, God didn't create the heavens in vain. And that can mean in waste, decay and emptiness. God didn't create it that way, but it became that way. He's not planning on leaving it that way. He has a plan for fixing it. But Romans 8 tells us that plan is waiting for man. In The Incredible Human Potential, Mr. Armstrong wrote, What an amazing, marvelous revelation of knowledge. No more amazing, awesome, eye-opening passage could be written. It is so astonishingly revealing. One doesn't fully grasp it, just reading quickly through. And this is really saying that our future and the universe's future are bound together. He summarized everything that we've covered, saying in Hebrews 1, we see that Christ, the first human to be born by a resurrection from the dead, has been glorified and now sustains the entire universe. He is our pioneer who's gone on ahead. At his return to earth in power and glory, those who have been converted and received God's Holy Spirit shall be born into the God family by a resurrection. Then the entire universe will be put into subjection under them. And I can't help but quoting just a little bit more to you from this, Mr. Armstrong writes, put all these scriptures I've used in this chapter, and we've summarized many of them uh, together, and you begin to grasp the incredible human potential. Our potential is to be born into the God family, receiving total power. We are to be given jurisdiction over the entire universe. What are we going to do then? These scriptures indicate we shall impart life to billions and billions of dead planets as life has been imparted to earth. See, God designed the universe to be inhabited. He is planning to impart life to it all. Mr. Armstrong continues, We shall create as God directs and instructs. We shall rule throughout all eternity. Revelation 21 and 22 show there, show there will be no more pain, no suffering, no evil, because we shall have learned to choose God's way of good. It will be an eternal life of accomplishment, constantly looking forward in super joyous anticipation to new creative projects and still looking back also on accomplishments with happiness and joy over what shall have already been accomplished. I want to conclude by looking at just one final scripture back in the book of Isaiah that helps reveal this incredible human potential. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 16. God says, and I have put my words in, in your mouth and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundation of the earth and say unto Zion, you are my people. God will plant the heavens. He will seed it with life, expecting it to grow into something even more beautiful and amazing. And we are a vital part of that. Mr. Armstrong wrote, This revealed knowledge of God's purpose for mankind, of man's incredible, awesome potential, staggers the imagination. Science knows nothing of it. No religion reveals it, so far as I know, and certainly higher education is in utter ignorance of it. This is the hope of the Bible. 
Paul called this hope an anchor of the soul. If you don't want your life to slip and slide around, if you want to have a fixed purpose, you need to make sure that your anchor is sure and certain. You need to prove this hope and study this hope. This hope will anchor your life. And Herbert W. Armstrong's book, The Incredible Human Potential, will help you do that. It will help you ensure that your foundation is rock solid. And he takes you through these scriptures and more step by step, helping you prove to yourself exactly what the true gospel is, how it relates to you, how it relates to the universe. And as with all our books and booklets, it's free. We'd be very happy to send it to you. You can read it online as well at our website, thetrumpet.com. But I really encourage you to get a print copy that you can go through and study a little bit every day with your Bible next to it and prove these scriptures to yourself. You know, Don't take my word for it. Don't take Mr. Armstrong's word for it. Prove it for yourself from the Bible. And getting a print copy is just a great way to really dig in and digest to digest that book. So you can go to our website, thetrumpet.com. You can click on the literature tab at the, the top right there. If you have any trouble, just drop us an email at trumpetworld at thetrumpet.com. Be very help, happy to help you get that book. Uh, you can send us any questions or comments there. We also mentioned the King of the South on this show and the Prophesied Prince of Russia booklet. I mean, those aren't unrelated. Studying Bible prophecy, watching these prophecies build, be fulfilled, it builds your faith in the Bible in this future. You know, that helps secure your anchor as well. Ultimately, this future is where all of these different pieces of Bible prophecy are leading and studying those bits of Bible prophecy that you can watch in the world around you, watching and praying. Well, that helps you see that this book, the Bible, is accurate and has real power. So you can dig in. We'd encourage you to dig into those those booklets as well. But certainly the incredible human potential is the one I would really, really urge you to go and read at the end of this at the end of this show. Well, we will be back on Friday once again, examining world events through the light of this book, showing how world events around you can secure that anchor of your soul. I'd like to thank the guests that we had today. We'd like to thank George Haddad and Isaac Lorenz for engineering and production. Please do comment and like and subscribe and all of those things do help get this message out. Thank you for joining us today. And until we're back, keep watching your world. 